Fellow Rotarians and friends, today marks a very significant occasion of our club, the visit of one of the outstanding members of our Senate. Having observed how both his parents devoted their lives to public service, he has been drawn to the challenge of public service early in his life. In 1992, when he returned to the Philippines from exile, he started serving the Philippine people once again and was elected to Congress as representative for the second district of Ilocos Norte. As congressman, he was instrumental in advancing the cause of cooperatives by devoting his countryside development fund to organizing co-ops for teachers and farmers. In 1998, he ran and won as governor of Ilocos Norte, serving three consecutive terms. During his term, he transformed Ilocos Norte to a first-class province, improving tourism development and pioneering wind power technology as an alternative source of energy. In 2007, he was elected back to the House of Representatives and he authored one of the most important legislation, the Philippine Archipelagic Baselines Law, or Republic Act 9522. In 2010, he ran for senator and placed seven overall. Presently, he chairs the Senate Committee on Local Governments and also the Committee on Urban Planning, Housing, and Resettlements. Our senator is a product of the most prestigious school in the Philippines. I hope you agree on this. <laughs> the LaSalle College for his elementary school. Just like me. <laughs> Finished his secondary education at Ward School, England. Earned his Bachelor in Political Science, Philosophy, and economics from Oxford University and obtained his master's degree in business administration at the Wharton School of Business. Hello, Rotarians and friends. Let us welcome our handsome and young looking senator, Senator Wong Wong Martin. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Charter President Alex Vespa. <laughs> And, uh, kind of introduction, especially the uh, the little lift for uh, us Lassalites after a heart-breaking loss. <laughs> One point to USD. Uh, it's, uh, we will come back. We will come back to the. Uh, uh, I suppose not much with the comments of uh, those who belong to that other school. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who are you? Why? Uh, I, Alex didn't mention, but the, as a matter of fact, I'm uh, uh, being, a, a, being green through and through uh, in my entire scholastic career, career here in the Philippines. I, uh, and, uh, having s said terrible things about uh, Athenians, <laughs> I ended up marrying one. <laughs> Improvement. <laughs> You know what they say, you want to improve the race, right? So we, we bring the best elements in you know, as we can. Uh, I'd like to just greet President Ben Torres, uh, Charter President Maciej Torres, uh, Charter President Sweetie Gardiner, and uh, another uh, green through and through, and I know this for a fact because we were in school together, Major Past President Vito Pandillo, President Boy Platon, Past President Palmi Layu, our Rotarians, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, good afternoon. It, uh, I was told, I was informed that uh, your club, and I, was, I, I always worry when I come to uh, speak before the Rotary as to what I am going to, to say. And I, I asked and I was told that uh, I was informed that your club would like to know of my legislative agenda as Senator. Let me take this singular opportunity then to discuss with you how a Senator 
or any other legislator for that matter, can be identified with a particular legislative agenda. The legislative agenda at the, at that of a legislator can be perceived through the following. First, through the proposed bills and resolutions that he or she personally files. Second, through the bills, now, though not necessarily their own, that the legislator prioritizes and facilitates processing in the committees and in the chairs. Third, through bills, whether again, their creation or not, that, he, that is individually supported, espouses, and votes for in the plenary, either because of personal conviction or other times because of party affiliation and advocacy. Experience and areas of strengths of the legislator can play a significant role in the shaping of the legislative agenda of that legislator. In my case, my nine years as governor of Ilocos Norte plays a crucial role in my critical understanding of the issues and problems con confronting our local government structures and the system of delivery of services of local government, local governments to their constituents. In fact, my experience was precisely considered by my colleagues and the leadership of the Upper House in entrusting to me the chairmanship of the Senate Committee on Local Government in the 15th Congress and in allowing me to retain it even after three years for this present 16th Congress. As luck would have it, I was eventually also given the chairmanship of the Local Government Committee and the Re Committee of Urban Development, Housing and Resettlement of the 15th Congress. This 16th Congress, I was again named the chair of local government committee of the local government committee, but was now appointed as the chair of the Public Works Committee, in addition to a number of vice chairmanships and memberships in other Senate committees. This year too, I have been named a member of the Commission on Appointments representing one of the Senate seats. I can say to you and report to you with some amount of pride and satisfaction that over the past three years I have managed to produce a decent portfolio of accomplishments that can be considered worthy and in fulfillment of the expectations of our country. In my first three years as Senator, I filed 34 bills of which five were signed into law. One, penalizing driving under the influence of alcohol and dangerous drugs, defining the use and protection of the Red Cross, creating regional trial court branches, improvement of our national health insurance, and the cyber, cyber crime law. As the chairman of the, of the Senate Committee on Local Government, we were also able to pass legislation by acting on the bills of our counterparts in the House of Representatives, geared at re-engineering our local government structure through the creation of certain provinces and barangays, conversion of qualified municipalities into cities, reapportionment of legislative districts. One example of this is Quezon City, which gained two districts in July 2012, in addition to the four that exist so far. In my three-year chairmanship of the Senate Committee on Urban Development, Housing and Resettlement, we were able to pass on third reading the creation of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and prioritize other bills on socialized housing, including a more concrete bill focused on housing programs for government employees. I also registered in my official positions on other my official position on other important legislative proposals. Some of them were these. I registered a yes vote on the K-12 education system and the reproductive health bill, bearing in mind the health of our underprivileged pregnant mothers. On the SIN tax bill, I voiced my strong opposition to the exorbitant increase in the, in the excise taxes on tobacco products, which I noticed was then being pushed without strong economic rationale. Needless to say, I was also deeply concerned for the livelihood of our tobacco farmers, especially from, from my home region in the north, who I believe have been adversely affected by the eventual enactment of the law. I, I noted in the uh, debates during the syntax that people were somehow surprised or highly critical of the position that I took and uh, to the point that I was even being accused of being in the pocket of the uh, tobacco industry and uh, there were several posts in the reports to that, to that effect. 
But I, I think it, it, was a, it was, I was very perplexed by this reaction because, after all, uh, it, is, it would be a natural position for me to take because in my entire public life, I have served, I have served as a representative of the province of Ilocos Norte. It is only since I became senator that my constituency had changed, and that's why I think that uh, it was a little bit disingenuous of some people to say that it was a surprise for me to oppose the syntax, the syntax bill. I also supported the cybercrime law, which, despite some of its flaws, my version, incidentally, did not include the uh, uh, the very controversial, uh, the very controversial provisions on libel. Uh, it's a very important, although despite that, it's a very important piece of legislation for us. Amid the intensifying effect of the information and digitation, digitization age, I do agree that some of the flaws could stand amendments as soon as possible, and we are working on those. This 16th Congress, I have so far found 40 bills. The areas covered by these bills are education, local government, environment, agriculture, housing, cooperatives, public works for the most part. Now as to this Congress, I authored the postponement of the Senate. This is something that we just uh, we just finished last week as a matter of fact. I authored the postponement of the San Gunian Kamadang election to introduce reforms to this very important sector of our local government. This bill is now awaiting the signature of the President and will be the first bill to be enacted into law by the 16th Congress. I have also refiled the bill to increase the monetary benefits of our barangay officials and workers and also the volunteers. These, these, are, these and many more, but to mention all, would uh, take far too much time and would be too long uh, for, 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 this, uh, for this meeting. Finally, since my appointment in this Congress as the Chairman of the Senate Committee on Public Works, I have initially conducted a hearing with the Department of Public Works and Highways and Secretary Babe Singer with regard to the flood management plan of the country and measures regarding disaster mitigation through the management of the river basins primarily in Metro Manila but also in the other urban areas. And it was uh, during, this, during these hearings we basically got a briefing from uh, Sec uh, Secretary Babe Simpson, and uh, it was overwhelming in the complexity and the, uh, the enormity of the job at hand for us to be able to mitigate the effects of uh, years and years of neglect, and that's why the flooding that we see on a regular basis in Metro Manila. We also deliberated at this hearing the plans and programs of the National Irrigation Administration with regards to the state of our farms because it is very, very clear that if we are going to increase our production, uh, our agricultural production, so as to be able to finally achieve food security, the question of irrigation is a critical one. The, without, without a very strong and very thorough and very complete extensive irrigation system, that dream of uh, uh, food security will never happen. Being lined up now are legislative proposals about the disposition and utilization of the, of the motor vehicle users charge, which as we all know is charged to, to us vehicle owners and which are collected when our motor vehicles are registered at the LTO. Also on the table will be other proposed infrastructure projects focused on flood mitigation, farm to market roads, renewable sources of energy, and one area that I have begun to study uh, very seriously is the, the problem of job creation and the problem also of the distribution of wealth. We hear so very much about how the um, the Philippines growth, the economic growth of the Philippines is uh, surpassing China or equal to China, which is probably the fastest growing economy now. And uh, but again, accompanying those reports, we also hear how unemployment is steadily increasing and how poor people are still very poor. And so this growth is not going, is not reaching the, is not reaching all uh, our citizens. And uh, this is something that we 
in government should really examine because it is our job to make sure that the benefits of any economic growth be felt by all. Secondly, there is simply, um, when asked, our citizens always talk about their problems of finding a job. And unlike, for example, like in the United States, where the, the, the complaint is not that they cannot find a job, the complaint is the quality of jobs. And they say these jobs aren't, you know, aren't, up to, aren't, aren't uh, important enough uh, for what, what I'm trained for, for my kind of scholastic background, etc. Here in the Philippines, it is much more severe than that. In the Philippines, that question of the quality of jobs simply does not come up. And it is sim very, very simple, is that we want a job, any job. And that is why we have to do something to create that job, to, to translate that economic growth into jobs so that our people are working and we do not have to depend on our OFWs to keep our economy afloat. Lastly, I have been active in, in pending legislative proposed proposals to continue to guard and uplift the welfare of our overseas Filipino workers, our migrant workers. The problem that we are uh, beginning to see is that from the 70s, in the 70s, after the, um, the, the construction boom in the Middle East, because of the 1973 OPEC raising of all the, uh, all the oil prices and the concomitant uh, effects of that, the, the workers we were sending to the Middle East were professionals or skilled, at least skilled workers, they were engineers, uh, they were managers, and therefore their, the jobs that they, were, that, that they were performing in the Middle East offered some protections to that job and to the, our, our Filipino nationals. Since then, because of the scarcity of jobs back home, the average um, uh, overseas workers, their skill level has actually decreased. And we are now talking about domestics, caregivers, uh, janitors, uh, not, not even, not, we're not even talking about, about construction workers like plumbers or carpenters. It's unskilled labor. And by, vir by virtue of that, of that, that type of, of job, uh, the protections that are given them are much less. And therefore the abuse, the potential for abuse is much greater. And unfortunately, we have seen that kind of abuse uh, being, uh, being visited upon our nationals abroad for many, many reasons. And uh, it is something that, uh, again, it is, a, it is an enormous problem because the problem lies not only in the, for, in the places that our workers are working in, but also in the systems that we have adopted for sending those workers abroad. So uh, let me now conclude by thanking you once again for inviting me to your meeting. I know that uh, I have disappointed some of you because I have not stood here and uh, had any bombshells to drop, uh, like we have seen in the, uh, in the last three, few days of the session in the Senate. But uh, I'm sure that you will make up for that. You, I will have to make up for that during the question and answer period. I look forward to further service to one and all during the second half of my term as Senator, always to be your conscientious and committed partner in nation building. Maraming salamat at magandang tanghali sa inyong lahat na buhay.